loses its policy relevance, whether it's at a global level or at a national level or at a thematic level. So now we're starting to look at satellite imagery. You'll see a lot of satellite imagery in this presentation, yeah. And this is actually a 10 meter resolution uh, a data from the European Space Agency, the Sentinel uh, a satellite. And what you can see, if you can see, maybe only a, a few of you are close, I'm glad the media is close, you'll see a, a, a land cover map of South Sudan. And you notice there's a lot of uh, yellow and orange there that relates to shrubland and, uh, well, the grassland. Anyway, it doesn't show that very well, but in the book uh, you have it. So one of the obvious impressions that you get from looking through the satellite, the eyes of the satellite, is that South Sudan is a dry country, mostly. A little bit like Kenya, where I'm coming from, actually. Very much of a dry country. And then you imagine to yourself, what is the importance of water for a dry country? Keep that in mind as we as we go through the uh, presentation. The estimated area being about uh, 57,000 uh, uh, square kilometers, but that's an average figure. As you all know, when it rains, it gets big. When it uh, doesn't rain, it gets, gets uh, smaller, right? And we'll come back to that in a little bit. And it, it depends uh, largely on wet or dry season and or years. We'll come back as we as we look at that. So the impression that I want you to see this, this is kind of like this blue thing here called the suit. See it's kind of like a, uh, a set of lungs or a sponge I spoke of uh, yesterday. When you breathe in air, where does that oxygen go? It goes to the rest of the body, right? It goes to the rest of the body. A little bit like that. Think of the suit as offering breathing in air, if you will, but also water nutrients from the earth, solar energy, all of that is put together into this thing called a lung or a sponge or whatever it is, and then in time, it, it exhales, and it releases this energy, these goods, these services back into the environment, but over a longer period of time. And as you know, the uh, dry season gra grazing or village is a clear example of, of something that uh, benefits from that release of the energy, release of the of the production back into the environment. Are we together? Yes. Have to check. Now here, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas, for uh, adding this uh, slide to this. And I'm glad we have hydrogeologists in the room because they can explain this uh, uh, better than me. I'm not a geologist, but what I understand, it makes common sense to me, is that. Uh, if the, un if, the, if the rock layer and the, and the strata underneath the suit were porous, the water would penetrate and you would have a great aquifer. But that's not what you have, though. It's not porous, the water stays there, it becomes a swamp yeah. swamp. And uh, this, uh, this is uh, the name of the, uh, of the ge 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 uh, geologic formation. Um, 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 it's difficult for me to say, much less to understand. But anyway, you get the idea. It's not porous. Okay? But this is the reason why the suit is what it is. The, the geologists, the rock people, tell me. I believe them. Okay, now we're looking at uh, some uh, aerial view of the uh, of the uh, suit wetlands, and I think in this case was John. Is John here today? I don't see him. But anyway, uh, so we were, we benefited very much from the support. This is not just something that was done from the outside, but the, the level of communication we had with the ministry throughout the study, the materials that they brought, the validation of the uh, of the of the of the entire report was very important in terms of giving it credibility. Okay, but here, what do you see? Again, uh, that light is a bit strong, but I can you see back there? Yeah, no, sure. Okay, what do we see? We see what looks like a very flat, swampy area, right? <coughs> what else do we see? We see these kind of oval, uh, oval vegetation, floating islands of vegetation, right? Yes. And these things are maybe a couple hundred meters across, or something like that, and they they float depending on whether the waters are high the weather, uh, or low, they change, right? And the wind direction. 
Okay, so anyway, this is, imagine, keep this image in mind, because when we talk about flooding, we want to keep this image in mind when we talk about the effects of flood, okay? You continue. <coughs> now we're going to show a very important aspect of the sewage wetlands, and that is the dynam its dynamic nature. This is fundamental to the understanding of the sewage. So here we have a satellite image. This is again a Sentinel, uh, uh, I'm not sure, yeah, that must be Google Earth. This came from Google Earth, so it's free data. And what you see here is a water body to the left. This image is from January 2020, right? And what you see over here is, okay, here we have water, here we have a water channel. What is this? Probably a burn scar. It's very typical of a burn scar, something, something got burned, cleared vegetation or something like that. Okay, so remember, this is January 2020. Was this a wet or a dry year? So dry. 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 Well, in January, you would think it would be dry, right? But 2020 was one of the years where the water started increasing. We'll come back to that in the point. But anyway, keep this image in mind when we go to the next one, which is the same area. But this is now in April. What did you see a difference in change? Huh? What, what has changed? Vegetation. Well, something moved. This, I'll just go back so that uh, in case you were thinking of something else. This is what it was in January. This is what it is in April. Same place. What happened? The vegetation moved. Is it the wind? Possibly. Probably. Is it currents? Possibly. Probably. We don't really know. And that brings up a very important point for understanding soup. We need to understand its behavior. So if you're going to talk about diking or dredging or anything, I think I'd want to know a little bit about how the environment is behaving in response to this dynamic change, right? Now when we had our workshop in inception and uh, uh, validation, we asked ourselves too, what, not only are these floating islands of vegetation moving around, but there's something else that's going on on them. Can someone explain the color change in some of these floating islands of uh, vegetation? Anybody have an idea? Please. Anyway, what I know about the changes of the color, whether the color tends to be gray, gray. These, these are dry grasses. Yeah. More especially from. That's all right, you know. That's okay. That's okay. I want you to see that again, this is a dynamic environment. That we do not understand fully. This question was raised already in the workshop that we had here, and I heard various explanations as to why this one is brown and this one is green. Was it that they were clearing papyrus and using that? Was it their cattle were grazing there? Somebody said that beetles were coming to eat the vegetation and that they just stayed on the floating islands. We heard many different possible. Uh, explanations, and I, I, I appreciate the red pen in the air, and with your experience, you're going to solve the uh, mystery for us. I think, uh, <coughs> you see, in the suit to the, the mountain or the fishermen, they will always go to areas where the water is stagnant. Yes. There is a lot of water, but it's stagnant. Then they build a reed, a reed uh, supporting kind of thing. I have and then bring me. in uh, mud, and they make they are cooking place and they stay in such a stagnant water i think at this system the water is not moving and the wind is not also high so they stay in this place and they move to the fishing areas and then this becomes the connecting center so and this is because maybe they put the reed and they put the mud and they stayed in this place for some times thank you thank you very much right now these are hypotheses Right, and I appreciate your addition to that. We'll take a look at some fishing camps in, in just a little bit, but again, my point is there's so much that we don't know about the soup. 
I mean, if these are just fishing camps, why a small one, big one is possible. Why is this cleared and why don't they just sit on part of the vegetation? There's a lots of questions that I would ask uh, to uh, better understand your explanation. I would expand that. That's okay, that's okay. But I'm just trying to say we need to improve our knowledge of the suit before you come up with any structural changes which are going to, we don't understand it to the depth that we need to. And the people who depend on this, because if these are all just fishermen, they want to know exactly if you're going to change or drain or whatever, they want to know. Okay, we move on. There's another change pair. So this, so what we saw in the last pair of images was changed within one year. And you already saw that there was a quite a bit of change, right? Just in that one year, in four months time, right? January was the beginning, but in the middle of the dry season, by the time April comes along, it should be the end of the dry season. Is it the winds that are moving these islands around? But here, the, here we have a picture from uh, 2013. And if you look at it, it just looks okay. You see things that look like floating islands of vegetation, I don't know what these straight lines are. Every time you see straight lines on a satellite seismic, image, you think that some human being has been running the, around there. These are the seismic uh, lines. Huh? The seismic lines. Seismic lines. They could be, but this is... survey for oil exploration. Possibly. Yeah. That's a... Uh, thank you very much. I, I'm glad there's somebody who has wisdom. Uh, we appreciate your wisdom I and your there. contribution. I did some work. Uh, this is what... This is, uh, this is what we need. We need validation. And you're giving us validation. So this is in uh, 2013. Now we're going to look at this a few years later, same time period. So this would be uh, 12. So the, uh, December would be a little bit the dry season, wouldn't it? Normally. This is the same area. Now we're in 2016. This is uh, 10, so that's uh, October. And you see the difference. So if the, this now is underwater. And you see this area looks like it's been cleared or something like that. There had been vegetation there for uh, uh, three years ago, but now it's changed. Again, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is a dramatically changing environment that is not well understood. Okay, are we together? So what is the importance of this dramatically changing environment? First of all, I'll mention that uh, migratory bird flyways. So many birds traveling, transiting between Africa and Europe and back again, use the Nile River Basin and the Sud wetlands as an important stopover uh, for their flight, for their pathways. And because of its importance, the government of South Sudan was invited and they signed the Ramsar Convention, which is on wetlands of international importance. They signed that. And as part of their commitment to that Ramsar Convention, they must conduct baseline surveys of the wetland so they contribute that to the international knowledge. Did that happen in South Sudan? If I understand correctly, the money was available. They had some $3 million or something like that from uh, Norwegians, is the way I think, uh, David, you were telling us. Or somebody, you know, anyway, anyway uh, and because of insecurity, it never happened. So that is a promise that was made, not yet delivered, but it's still needed. And it just goes back to, again, emphasize this question of trying to understand the science of the suit before you embark on any structural changes, okay? And just before we, and we'll come to this question later on, and this is a question that has no answer, but I'll ask it just the same. How much is it worth to have a, uh, a, a landing spot for birds that are going between Africa and uh, Europe? Does anybody want to put a, a shilling, dollar figure on that? You can't. So when the thing is gone, that you miss it, you say, geez, I wish I could have done something about it. But that's one of the problems that we face in the suit. And I'll come back to this point again in the presentation. We have value here, but we don't know how to quantify it. Because when you are making arguments with policymakers on the other side, they need to know some of these numbers. What is the value of this? Who's going to pay for this? It becomes a, a, a negotiation. But if you don't have any kind of assessment, 
your 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 feet become weak. And the same thing go, applies for ungulates, your deer, your uh, white-eared cob, and your tiang. They also benefit from the uh, dry season pasture that's there. And and I've had uh, many discussions during the workshops here. You believe that the migration that you have here in South Sudan is at the same level as the wildebeest migration that transfers from the Serengeti in Tanzania up into the Maasai Mara in Kenya. It's hard to get good statistics on that. But again, what is the value of such a, a service? Well, uh, the Nile Basin Initiative did try to put a value on it, and they said $600 million per year, if you can promote the tourism. But then the tourism needs security, it needs infrastructure. But you can see there would be many, many people who would be interested in such a, uh, a capacity that South Sudan has to offer to the world. Okay? Put a dollar value on it? Well, $600 million. But what is the infrastructure that is there? What, how do you how do you start with that? In? Difficult questions. But if you, uh, as uh, Joseph was saying a, a, a few minutes ago, if you're looking into the future and you want to protect these resources, if you lose this, you've lost six hundred million dollars a year. Just as a, an example, okay? Are we together? Mm -hmm. Still. Now we're going into a little bit of the science of hydrology, flooding, and climate change. So we're taking a, a slightly different look from where we were before. I'll start with a, uh, a graph of potential evapotranspiration. You know evaporation is what that is, right? You know what transpiration is, right? Transpiration is what comes from the plants. You put them together, you have evapotranspiration. And this is potential. So this is what uh, they could uh, estimate uh, using various models. And here, if you look, there's one, two, three, four, five, six uh, different ways of estimate, estimating, or not ways, that's not correct, models of uh, potential evapotranspiration over the soup. And you look at them, and you know, you, you know, the more you look at it, I won't go into great detail, mostly they show the seasonal variation. You would expect there's high potential evapotranspiration when in the dry season. Sun is strong, water is low, there's going to be a, a great loss to the atmosphere. This time of year should be less. Cloud cover and the other things which uh, change uh, the rate of potential evaporation. So that one, you see that in general trends, except for this one here, shows the opposite. Can't say why. But even the ones that do show that general trend, there's a variance there. Again, one of the key messages here is that we need to better understand potential evapotranspiration. Why? Well, the Egyptians are interested in it. Because if you lose this evapotranspiration and it's lost to the world never to come back, that's, they see that as a loss to them. Whether or not that's true is another question because some of it does come back, some of it does go to the uh, farmlands in South Sudan, and so there's value there. But you really have to understand that if you're going to uh, uh, make any kind of engineering solutions, right? This is one of my favorite slides. This comes from NASA. So what this is, is altimetry data from the satellite. So what it measures is lake heights, or if you will, open water body heights. Okay? And so this is the raw data, and this is smooth data. But you see it's basically the same trend. There's a gap in the middle. Let's just look at this, and what, what do you recognize here is a kind of an up and down uh, variation there. What is that? It's dry season. Dry season. It's season. Wet season. Wet season. Clear, right? Obvious. Now, as you move, and you know, you see that pattern. This starts in 1992, and uh, it goes forward. What happens around 2019, 2020? It's going up. Something happened, and the satellite certainly caught this. I mean, the people living there know it fully, but something happened. What happened was that around, I guess, it was in November or so, 2019, should be the dry season, right? What happened? It rained. It rained a lot. So normally, when they, at that time, 
when this sponge called the suit was exhaling the water, the energy to the environment, instead of that it was told to inhale and it couldn't release the water to the back to the river channels like it would normally. So you have a, a kind of a uh, multiplic multiplicative effort where the because it's or an additive, let's just call it additive, not multiplicative, uh, additive uh, uh, impact whereby the uh, not being able to release the water back into the environment, it just adds up, and the capacity to absorb is completely full. And that's what led to. When the rains came back again in the in the following wet season, it was already building up. Do you understand that? That's a very important uh, thing that the satellite will corroborate with anything that you find on the ground, and it's good because you understand the historical trends and you see something happen. Now, is that climate change? Definitely, it's possible. It's possible. We'll, we'll come back to that because I want to talk a little bit about the IPCC uh, projections on that. But uh, if this is climate change, then we've got a we've got an issue here, don't we? Point is, is that the the, the, the waters were, re, were were rising because it was raining in the dry season when it normally doesn't. And so now you, have, I think this is uh, also comes. Is this from the UN or OCHA? I'm not sure. It's one of those things. But anyway, this is a, a map of the flood areas, and what you see in bright red are the most impacted areas, right? You've probably seen this before. And so going back to uh, Joseph's uh, intervention at the beginning, whether you're putting in dikes or you're putting in, uh, or you're going to dredge, one obvious question is these red spots could be, could be a possible location of such efforts to kind of reduce the stress. Okay. But anyway, almost a million people uh, suffered, and you can imagine why. And let me just, there's a point that I forgot to mention, so I'm going to go back. If you can read on the right-hand side of the, uh, of, the, of the graph, how much did the water rise? 400 Well, I'm just saying, so if this were an average at 419, how did how much did it go up to? One full meter. Huh? One About full one meter. meter. So you go back to that satellite, I mean to the aerial photography, and we saw a very flat land. Imagine one additional meter on top of that entire land. And, of course, it's localized. The point is, is that, you know, I, I, I spent time in the east coast of the United States. We knew hurricanes. That water comes, pours, creates damage, and it moves on. After a few days, maybe a week or two, moves on. This water's not gonna leave. This water stays there. And that's why the people suffered so much, is not only the additive effect, but it's also the fact that the water did not leave. It just impacted their lives for long periods of time. Right, I forgot to make that point the previous day. Excuse me when I go back. And so that's what the, those are the people who are affected. And again, what's it look like from the satellite? You look at these two images, they're hard to read because this is December 2019. This is uh, for December 2021 when uh, the floods were at their worst. Do you see much difference between those two? Not too much. The one on the right has a little bit more black, which means open water in this, uh, in this image, okay? So from a satellite, okay, well, yeah, I'm sure there's some difference, but on the ground, you can see that those little red points are obviously what uh, what uh, what stands out. But here you get an idea, yeah, there's something going on on the right in uh, 2021 as compared to 2019. So what does it look like on the ground? So this is uh, flooding in Bortown uh, from you and this. And it doesn't look that bad. I mean, obviously, the people there are unhappy because they can't get around, right? But the people who are living there are somehow impacted. So here you have a picture of uh, some children trying to uh, encourage, I, I can use that word, their cattle to move to uh, higher ground. 
right? And so they, they, they get in their canoes and they move them along, tie their heads up so they, just stay, they stay above the water and they move to higher ground. This is the kind of impact that is very much the, 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 the effects of the flood, okay? So, talking a little bit about climate change, because we, uh, I asked that question a little bit earlier, but this is what's coming from the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. First, heavy rainfall events are projected to increase over the region, and they're specific to the African highlands. So we're talking about Uganda, that part of western Kenya, you know, the uh, Albertian Valley, you know, those parts that are, at the, if you will, the uh, the uh, water towers of this region. They're also talking about drought frequency and duration and intensity are projected to increase, if in, et cetera, et cetera, but South Sudan is under there. So you have a situation where these are just predictions, these are models, if it's something that needs to be understood. But the point is, if there's more water coming off the highlands into South Sudan, you need to prepare for that. Also, the other factor uh, that you have to consider is that uh, you know, in the lowlands in South Sudan, you may, may be facing more variability in your rainfall, more flooding, but also more droughts. And I guess the uh, thank you. Uh, and I guess the uh, the point here is that right now everybody is talking about flooding, right? How to alleviate the impact of flooding, right? But you also have to plan for the drought. The drought will come. So don't, don't be so focused on one element when you're trying to uh, address the environment. You have to look at the big picture. And that's the power of an integrated assessment. You try to look at the big picture, not just one particular element like, okay, we're going to put uh, do dredging in this area. Maybe a temporary solution, but you really have to understand the big picture. Here. So now we're going to change site. We're, uh, we're talking about climate change, but in this case, we're talking about peatland. You all know what peatlands are. I know you geologists love this stuff. You uh, get it home every day, right? You like your peatland? Uh, what it is is uh, just thick waterlogged soil, very, very high in carbon uh, content. Uh, known internationally as an uh, important carbon sink because it is, ha has that dense uh, density, high density of carbon. Obviously, you need to look at it. It's, it's where carbon stays, all the dead plant matters that goes down, right? It stays, uh, stays there. And it's the largest natural terrestrial carbon store in the world across uh, uh, peatlands internationally. And the point here, and this is a, a major point for the international community, is that if you damage, for example, if you were to drain the wetlands, you would see a release of CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay. We'll come back to that because I have some more satellite imagery on this. How are we doing on time? Joseph? You want me to go faster? You're okay so far? Oh, there's John who showed up just to uh, I think these are I think this is your, your are these your hands in the picture? <laughs> no, this is my hand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. So anyway, uh, John is uh, taking a, a, a soil core. Uh, to uh, measure the depth of the peatland. Thank you very much. Once again, uh, again, credit to the ministry for really adding in important elements to this study. And this pie chart shows the distribution of peatlands within the Nile Basin country. Okay? And uh, that big green slice is South Sudan. And why does South Sudan gets a bigger green slice? Sure. 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 By far. <laughs> so the point is, is that, you know, from the international community and a climate change perspective and greenhouse gas emissions, this is something that needs to be monitored. And if you look at what that peatlands, or if you will, soil carbon looks like. Here's what, uh, again, from a satellite interpreted by the ISRIC, the International Soil Reference and Information Center. And here we have soil carbon as seen from space. So what you have is this very dark area is high concentration of soil carbon. Okay. 
and the areas that were surrounding it, as I was explaining earlier, grassland, shrubland, very low comparatively soil carbon, right? So imagine, just in your mind, if you drain the wetlands, and it, this became that, just for example, in your mind's eye, what would happen? You would lose all that carbon to the atmosphere. And uh, it's, a, it's a big contributor, not this, but globally, peatlands uh, do contribute, uh, the, the drying of peatlands do contribute uh, five, six percent to the, uh, uh, the global GHG budget. But anyway, this gives you an idea of uh, how uh, the, uh, the carbon sink is important for the global community. Now we're going to change. We're going from carbon to methane. And here, the idea that I want you to keep here is that it certainly is a sink. You can you can all you can see that with the with the imagery. Now we're looking at this is a, a tropospheric measuring instrument. Basically, it's looking at methane emissions. Okay. And what do you see? So this is emission. So this is methane that's coming off. And as you know. From your uh, high school studies, methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, right? As like 12 times or whatever the uh, the uh, what do you call it? What the, the carbon dioxide. Is. But fortunately, it only it, it, its latency time in the atmosphere is about maybe 12 years or something like that, compared to CO2, which is much longer. What do you see over the South Sudan? You see big red, meaning that uh, if I were concerned about methane emissions, I would look to South Sudan and I'd say, hey, why is all this methane coming out of the soup? And that is a concern, I mean, for some uh, in the international community, and it raises another question, where we need better science. On one hand, we see it as a sink, but here you say, ah, for, for me, think it's a source. Do we understand clearly the relationships and the trade-offs between methane as a source versus carbon as a sink? No. Do we need to understand this fundamental question as we see the suit's contribution to the international science? Yes. yes. And that's just a map uh, for showing for location. Are you with me? So, as I was saying, yeah, there's some questions. So we need more research in terms of uh, organic carbon research for possible carbon offsetting. So this is something that could be a future no negotiation with those people who want to purchase carbon rights from, uh, from South Sudan. The market is not that well developed, but it's possible. Uh, we know that flooding leads to carbon sequestration while drainage releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's pretty well known, but th these facts need to be confirmed. And methane uh, from the wetlands uh, and the response to cl climate change is still re uh, is an ambiguity that needs to be better understood. Okay. Can I say something about this? Yes, methane? please. Now we are talking about 45 million heads of cattle huh? concentrated in the Sioux area. And we know ruminants produce methane. Question mark. Go ahead. Excellent question. So where is the methane coming from? That is it. Is it from the south end of the cow? Big time. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's an obvious answer, but I, I would like to see that in we the public. We need to do some literature. research, yes. Yeah. So this is just, again, one of the examples why the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, hopefully with support from UNEP, uh, needs to elevate these questions to a higher international level and then use that to inform policy. Thank you, thank you. South end of a cow. So now we move uh, to the third part. And this is, in a sense, the most important part of the presentation because we're talking about the human beings that live there, right? That's, that's our focus. And how do we value uh, the services that the soup provides to them? And first, uh, 
Oh, this is uh, Lopidia. I don't see him here today. He's not here. He? Michael Lopidia. Huh? He's not here today. I don't think. But anyway, again, we thank him. So here you see uh, a typical area view of uh, a, a kind of a village uh, in the soup. It's called Toch. Huh? Toch. Toch, yeah. This is where the water goes up and down. Yeah. And that brings up another uh, question, but I won't go there just yet. But anyway, you can see this. Uh, these are kind of temporary uh, residential, but it looks like People are living there. They're trying to uh, make their livelihoods there. What do they do? You mentioned, uh, what, 45, 47 million? 45 million. Okay. Captain. So what the suit has, it has what we call our assets. Very simple concept. What are its assets? It's, first of all, land, right? Fishing equipment. If you're going to catch a fish. Cattle, goats, and sheep for various reasons. We eat the goats, we eat the sheep, but we trade uh, and we pay dowry with the cattle, right? What do these assets give us? From the land, we get sorghum, maize, groundnuts, cowpeas. If we have good fishing equipment, we can catch fish. I don't know about water lilies. I don't know what the, what the importance of water lilies is in the equation. Uh, other wild foods and vegetable, milk, and meat. So these are the assets, these are the production. This is fundamental to the soup. And again, uh, now we're in the Toich uh, lands again, seasonal. And uh, this again comes from uh, Michael. Michael Lopidia. Yeah, again, but uh, again, this just shows, uh, again, the kind of uh, uh, relationship between man and the environment. And here, I guess, you know, the importance is, is that, that Toich, the seasonal grazing that's available for the cows, is so important because if you take that seasonal pasture away then the cows are going to suffer that's fundamental because it relates to so much that's uh, characteristic of South Sudan and you know I have friends in Nairobi who are South Sudanese and they say Peter I just need to get 40 cows because I want to pay dowry <laughs> you know, if you don't have grass you're not going to be paying dowry so you have to uh, watch these things you know? <laughs> Well, you know, right now his focus in life is dowry. He's met this beautiful lady, wants to get married, but he doesn't have the cows. Has anybody here in that room ever been faced with that situation? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in Kenya, we pay goats. We just eat them. You guys trade them and uh, look at them and say, count them. That's what you guys do. Just count your cows. Okay, so uh, coming back to the question of a uh, fishing environment. So this is, uh, these are uh, fishing settlements. And you notice they're much smaller than uh, what you were mentioning uh, when you were interpreting the previous uh, uh, satellite image. But you can see they're just on a little piece of ground. As you say, they're around stagnant water. And uh, this is uh, so important for the livelihoods of the people. You know, it, whether it's drought or flood, you might be able to catch some fish. If you're hurting, you maybe, hopefully you catch more fish. But uh, so this is a fishing camp, temporary, of course. And this is production from the fishing camp. And again, this comes from uh, Michael. And again, you know, this is a very, uh, what do you call it, artisanal production. You know, I, this, I guess this is salt. Probably they're using to... Uh, yeah, salt. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, to uh, keep the fish uh, so they can serve it and hopefully get them to market. But this is an area where obviously the possibility of, uh, of introducing some kind of infrastructure, refrigeration, mm. hopefully not smoking the fish because then you're going to burn up all your wood, so that's a, that's a constraint. But anyway, this is a, a great area for investment. Within the this is all tilapia. Uh, tilapia, yeah, this looks like tilapia to me. I can almost taste it. <laughs> we eat a lot, you know, even in Kenya. We, but every time I come to Juba, I want to see tilapia, I want to see Nile perch. I don't need to see the meat. The meat are for dowry. I don't need that. I want to eat the fish. So now we're talking about ecosystem services. I, I mentioned this uh, briefly uh, uh, yesterday, but four kinds of uh, services. Provisioning, which you all know. The food we eat, the fuel we burn to cook our food, fiber for our clothes, and the timber for construction. These are all well known. You could put a price 
you can put a price on these uh, provisioning services without too much difficulty. Yeah? Regulating services, water partitioning, pest regulation, climate regulation, pollination. Can you put a price on that? Much yes. Yes. But you take them away, you cry because everything else depends on this. What about support services? The soil f formation. Again, if you don't have the soil, you don't have the grass. If you don't have the grass, you don't have the cow. If you don't have the cow, you don't have marriage. Right? These things are interrelated. And finally, cultural services. And that is, you know, throughout the centuries, communities there have been intermarrying. They do socioeconomic activities together. The cows bring their, not only the gas, but they also they bring their, their poop, right? into the lands, and that's something very valuable for the farmers. And there are all kinds of relationships, historical, not only in, in South Sudan, but across Africa that you find that have uh, developed from that relationship between the, the herders on one side and the people who are a little bit more sedentary on the other side. Yes, John? I'm sorry, spiritually, you know, the, the Sholo. The Sholo. Yeah. This uh, knowledge the taboo in the shoulder to eat in energy. So it's a part of conservation management. Yeah. Thank you for that point. Yeah, because they know that there's something that's valuable behind it so they don't waste the resource. Right? Sindio. The cultural services, yeah. So anyway, this is most important. And of these, if I had to put a dollar figure on some of these, I think that these are be very difficult. And this is what the Nile Basin Initiative did. They tried to put a dollar figure. They came up with $3.3 billion. Let's look at what they did. Now, I don't know if you can see this very well. I know this is too light, but the only thing that I'm going to uh, uh, call your attention to, yes, you know, you have the relationships. Dinka, New York, but uh, they only value this this section here, the cultural services, out of that 3.3 billion dollars, at 158 thousand dollars. And for me, that's just they use the information that they could. But if you have a cultural service that provides stability to an area such as the Sud, if you take that stability away. What would happen? Conflict. Can you put a value, a dollar value, on conflict prevention? No. You cannot. And I think that point has to be driven home in, in your negotiations is that the cultural aspects of the Sioux environment and how it relates to the culture is something that, for a young nation like South Sudan, you are the youngest nation in the world, right? Like most young nations, you've suffered uh, uh, from the growth pains, yes? You need stability. Peace is number one. Anything that you do to maintain peace is probably more important than some of these other uh, smaller technical discussions. Peace is crucial for this country. Anyway, uh, you'll, you'll see it in the, uh, you'll see, you can't see this figure because of the, of the thing, but $158,000 for cultural stability? I'm not criticizing them. They probably based it on the data that they had. But it just uh, I want you I want you to get the impression that the hardest thing to value in the suit is its cultural value, and yet it may be the most important aspect. Okay, here's a tough one: challenges and opportunities for ecosystem valuation. Uh, we come up with a 3.3 billion figure, right? But how much of that actually gets to the population that lives there? Very small. Very small. We say, okay, tourism, but how far away is tourism? We say fishing infrastructure is possible. But this remains a, 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 a soft point in this analysis, a weakness in this analysis, is that it's worth this much money but if you have no way of raising it, no way of paying for it, how do you do that negotiation? Payment for ecosystem services. Is it the Egyptians who pay? Is it the South Sudanese government who pays? Is it the oil industry who pays? To maintain that, because other, because if it has no value, it'll be taken away. Payment for ecosystem services. Tough question. Tough question. 
And then finally, going to the last part of the presentation, I'm just going to uh, uh, run through some research questions, again, for all you academics in the back row who are just thirsting for your next PhD. You take any one of these, you can convert this to a PhD research, and Joseph will hire you. Right? Yes. <laughs> okay, so we, we go through uh, various uh, dimensions of that. You need science for policy, and whether it's water for ecosystem services, as, we've been, as we have been discussing, electricity generation, you've been, this is on the, this is on the wish list, I guess, or on the agenda or something like that. You see what Ethiopia has done, you'd like to do the same thing, with good reason. Irrigation, I know the Agriculture Master Plan discusses this opportunity. It's one of your long-term objectives. Flood control. Right now, it's in, it's in every day newspaper this morning, and, and Nicholas and I, you know, for the last few days, we check the newspaper every day. What are they saying? What are they saying? It's dredging, 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 dredging. You need science, too. <laughs> so, some questions. We start with meteorology, okay? So these are some specific questions that need to science to inform policy. We start with meteorology. Maybe this first question is not a PhD, it's a master's thesis. Anybody here looking for a master's degree? No, you all have them. Okay, that's good. Uh, what are the evapotranspiration rates in the soup? Why is this an important question? Because we need to understand its behavior before you manage any part of that water, whether it's going downstream to the Egyptians or whether it's going in an agriculture environment, you're going to put it in a reservoir. You need to understand these basic, basic facts in connection with any planned structural development. And then, there's another question which has been raised but I've not seen any uh, answers to yet. Of all that water that's evaporated or transpired, how much of it goes back into the system? In other words, it rains over the student, so you can't say that it's a loss, it's actually just it's borrowed for a little time by the atmosphere. And then finds its way back into the river. Another way of looking at that is that maybe it rains on some lands that are adjacent to the White Nile and it provides them millet or sorghum, those kinds of are, are grass for their cows. So that's something that you also have to factor into your analysis. Again, there's no, it's, it's just another science question that needs an answer. Hydrology. And these are tough questions. But again, uh, everybody here wants a PhD. What are the peak and low flows needed to maintain ecosystem services to support the livelihoods? So, and, and I, I tried to make this point uh, this morning to the uh, Egyptian uh, 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 attaché. The point here is that if you're looking for a engineering solution for the suit, for example, whatever you do, don't manage for the average manage for the variability. Let me explain that from various uh, perspectives. Because there will be low flows and high flows, that's normal. You have, to, you have to account for that. You don't account for the, uh, you don't just account for the average, right? And also between, within seasons and between seasons, these things uh, will, uh, will happen. And the other thing is that if you, no, anyway, I'll, I'll come back to that in a bit. What is the volume of stream flow that needs to be reduced to avoid catastrophic flooding? So if you had a dream world, you would be able to take all that water that affected these communities, particularly in the northern part, and you could just put that wherever, in the Jones Lake Canal, or I'll spread it on your agricultural land. That would be an ideal solution. You maintain the high and low flows that allow the grass to grow, the, that gives you the cows, that gives you marriage and everything else. So you keep both. That would be an ideal solution. Boy, but the science is not there to, uh, to reach that ideal solution just yet. Is it possible to reopen the Jungle Canal and send some of the portion of the high flows downstream? That's the question. And it's still on the table. And we need to do that, we need to assess the accuracy of current estimates for stream flow volume volumes. Because when UNEP did this assessment, there are still varying figures. The numbers were not consistent, so we have to have more confidence in the, in the, in the uh, estimates of hydrology. Again, PhD, masters, new jobs, wonderful. 
Greenhouse gas and climate change. Are they a sink? Is the feet as a sink or a source? Obviously it's a sink, but there's still some questions in terms of how it really whether it's the cows. Good morning, whether, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. How are you? So Lima Lisa. So uh, uh, how how do you interpret the? Do, do, are you? Does she have a chair? Honorable yeah, Minister, would you like to join us? How long is it? Oh, I, I'm at the end. Okay. I've got another three, four minutes, so you can answer the questions that I've asked. Are you going? So. Another question is how to interpret the latest IPCC projections for East Africa for predictive management of the sued wetlands. So we said that if it rains in Uganda and those other uh, areas that are feeding the White Nile, but it's not raining so much or we have higher variability in South Sudan, what do you do to, uh, 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 to, to prepare for this increased flooding coming out of Uganda? Maybe not flooding, but at least high flows. You need to have some kind of an uh, agreement with the Ugandans, don't you? To understand, you know, what's coming your way. You also have to have maybe whether you're talking about reservoirs or some kind of changes in terms of engineer, engineering, you need to factor that into if indeed you take confidence in what the IPCC is saying. And as we mentioned earlier, methane emission and carbon sequestration uh, are other big research questions. I said that earlier, I don't need to repeat that here. Big questions. Again, we just discussed them. How do you put a dollar figure on cultural values? As I looked around the room, most of you said you can't. It's too important. It's too important, so you can't put a dollar figure on that. Here's a key question, which will certainly be coming to the ministry. Which environmental and social impact assessments are required if the Zongale Canal is restarted, or even if there is dredging, or even if there is a dikes being built, or even if there's reservoirs being built. All of these questions need environment and social impact, and particularly with those people who live in the areas concerned. I mentioned these two questions before, but for bird migration, is there a value that we can put on that? It has value, but tough. Same thing for the animal species. Okay, we have a $600 million a year figure that's been given us us by the Nile Basin Initiative, but if it's if it's in the distant future, what is its value today? Tough questions, but important questions for the future of South Sudan. Uh, constraints, access. Right now, uh, as you know, it's not an area where roads. Uh, there are not that many roads leading leading into the Sud. You have to go get there by boat mostly. Funding is an issue. We hope that. Uh, you're able to attract further funding for uh, a better understanding of the underlying science, maybe uh, GEF or GCF. Uh, and I think that uh, if the international importance is elevated, the fundraising possibilities also increase too. Security has been a, a problem in the past. That's the reason why the Ramsar Convention uh, 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 promises were not uh, implemented. And capacity building. Any time that uh, there is research going on in this country, the people in the back row here must participate. You must have a role to play. You must find a way so that knowledge does not escape, but actually stays and builds your databases in your own environment and information systems. Coming to the end, key recommendation, examine the policies, practices, and impacts of the possible revival of the Jungle Lake Canal. The principle, and I think this was, uh, uh, we picked this from the Voice of America, water, South Sudanese people and ecosystems first. Everybody, and I think no matter who you talk to, nobody will disagree with the state. ESIA, environmental and social impacts with infrastructure products. An early warning system. This you have to do together with your friends in Uganda because they're the ones who control the dams and uh, can give you some idea of what's going to happen. You cannot tell them not to release the water. That you cannot do. Or maybe, anyway, you might be able to strike some kind of agreement with them. Flood control, we talked about that. And per perhaps the most important from the, from the uh, side of UNEP is to reduce uncertainties in the science. We see many examples, whether we're talking about hydrology, meteorology, 
you know, human conditions, so many examples of where the science is not mature enough to be able to support decision making. And then finally, conclusions, is the interplay among science, policy, and politics is complex and dynamic, but offer research possibilities. And again, I'm, uh, again to you on the back, low, back row who are looking at research opportunities, if you just look at hydrology, you can do your master's thesis. But if you look at hydrology and its relation to the people, then you've got your PhD thesis, thesis because you're looking at the bigger picture. This is the kind of research that uh, uh, South Sudan needs. Um, here's an example of the uh, need for science to inform policy and influence politics. The barriers, as we said, are high, but think of the benefits to the country are even higher. So this is not uh, this is a, not a mission you can say no to. And finally, as I said, capacity building must be a part of any solution that you propose. So my last slide is, I think, uh, I know that UNEP, when they, you know, co cooperate with you to launch a report, there should be it should be available online. I don't know the exact status of that, but uh, I don't know if Nicholas or or Charles Sebupier or somebody can uh, tell us. But this this report is available. It's finished. It's been launched. It should be available online so that anybody in the room can look at it, read it, and think about the future of South Sudan and uh, the Sud environment. So that's, I thank you, Mr. Santeni Sana. Okay, thank you uh, very much. I would like to welcome the minister. Yes. We have come now and joined us, and I think we are now in the last portion of our presentation, which is some burning questions that teacher can respond to. So I will give, I'll open the floor for questions, and hopefully you have to be brief. It should not be a comment, but a question, because Peter has 30 minutes to go to the